this elective is called the Science of Winning, um, and uh, the it's sort of broken down into three sections. There's an introduction, there's the benefits of competition, and then the most of the lecture is principles of competition. So, introduction. First, competition is intense. Competition is different from practicing, and it's different even than performing in front of an audience. A study that compared skydiving to, of all things, ballroom dancing competitions found that the pressure of ballroom dancing induced a stress rush just as strong as someone's second parachute jump. Alex, yeah, you've already seen this. Go somewhere else. I know, but like, this is what Go next door. Here. I, I know. Go somewhere else. Fascinatingly, the study was of experienced ballroom dancers with an average of 10 years of competition. So 10 years into your ballroom dancing competitive career, ballroom dancing competitions are still as scary as jumping out of an airplane 10,000 feet in the air. Even with all of that experience, plus thousands of hours of practice, ballroom dancing was still enormously stressful. They didn't get bored, they didn't lose the anxiety, and the stress was just as much as in their first competition. The reason for that is because the difference between skydiving and ballroom dancing in competitions is not just that in one of them you are you know, always at risk of plummeting to the ground to your death. It's that the second of them, ballroom dancing, involves being judged. And so the same things that make ballroom dancing very anxious for people, evidently, make debate very anxious. For those of you who feel like the energy and the pressure and the excitement of debate tournaments is almost like nothing else that you get to do, you're not alone. It's competition that creates that unique mix of excitement and fear that you're experiencing. Obviously, there are lots of benefits of debate other than competition. You get to learn how to research, you practice public speaking skills, you get to work on a team. And I spend a lot of time extolling those benefits both to uh, prospective debaters and their parents. But for many of you, the real reason that you do debate, all of those things are just side benefits to getting to do what you love, which is engage in one of the most high intensity academic competitions that exist. You want to win. And this elective is about winning. So why are you here? This lecture will teach you a few things. It'll teach you about the benefits of competition. It will teach you how to use hundreds of scientific studies on winning condensed into 12 principles about competition to improve your chances in every debate that you participate in. It will teach you how to view and deal with stress and anxiety in order to maximize your performance. It will go into how differences in your biology may influence how you respond to competition and what you can do about that. It will teach you a little bit about how to debate to win instead of debating not to lose and why that's actually a, there's a scientific difference there. And finally, it will teach you how to structure and organize your debate team in order to get the most out of each person out. Most of this lecture comes uh, from the New York Times best-selling book called Top Dog. It's by these two people, Poe Bronson and Ashley Merriman. Uh, and they are the winners of nine national awards for science reporting, uh, including the Penn USA Award for Literary Journalism and the American Association for the Advancement of Science Award for Outstanding Journalism. So uh, they're very good. What they, what they do is they take dozens or hundreds of studies and condense them down into things that you can understand. And what I've done is I've taken many of those studies and the reporting about those studies and turned names and things that you can use about debate. So if you're interested in this lecture, consider giving the book a try. It's pretty interesting uh, and not a hard read. Next section, the benefits of competition. I want to start this by getting you all to think about competitive fire, which is something that the Greeks called aratas. A-R-E-T-A-S, aratas. Some of you may have heard a little bit about this in lab already. According to historian J.E. Lendon, for the Greeks, competition was the outlet for all of the other possible virtues. It was how they expressed courage, it's how they expressed loyalty, it's how they expressed trustworthiness. And the idea of aratas was that you were the perfectly honed competitor. You were able to turn up the fire in the heat of battle or in the heat of a competition in order to make yourself the best that you could possibly be. Competitive fire is simply just being able to do better when you're challenged. So it's being better in a debate than you are in practice. It's being better in your most important debates than you are in your less important debates. Studies on this reveal that many people do much better when they're in science or in competitive situations, but some people do about the same and some do much worse. More, about 50% of you do much better when in a competitive situation. So you're like pretty good in practice, but you're awesome in the debate tournament. And you're even more awesome in your biggest debate. About 20% of you are able to give your maximum effort without the pressure of competition. You don't need that extra fire in order to do your best. You're bringing it every single day. 
Lab leaders probably love you. Uh, and then about 20% of you do much worse in competition. You are a good practicer, you do all of your stuff, you're getting everything right, and then it comes time to perform, and you sort of crumble under the pressure. We're, this elective is designed for all of you, um, and how every type of person can sort of maximize their ability to compete successfully. Before the principles of competition, though, it's important to think about the differences between adaptive and maladaptive competitiveness, which just means like competitiveness for good or competitiveness for evil. When are some times where being competitive is helpful? This is an actual question. Yeah? In a debate. Okay, in a debate. In a debate, definitely being competitive is helpful. When else? We don't only debate, right? We do other things, ostensibly. When else can being competitive help you? Free market. Free market, okay, I like it. Debate, the free market, board, board games, all sorts of times, the basketball game, pick up basketball game over lunch. Being competitive will help you do better at all those things. When can being competitive hurt you? Yeah. Like, you're just kind of like playing like a game that doesn't really matter with like friends and then you take it too seriously. Yeah. Um, that's exactly what we're getting at here, which is that adaptive competitiveness means persevering and rising to the challenge in a game, a debate, a chess match, whatever. But it also means respecting and following the rules. Adaptive competitiveness means feeling satisfaction and working hard and doing your best even if you don't win. Maladaptive competitiveness are the people who are so insecure that they have trouble losing. And what he just described, which is people compete even when others aren't competing. The person who's like really, really way too excited to win the pickup basketball game. The rest of this lecture is about becoming adaptively competitive, how to maximize your use of the competition environment to increase your overall winning, and also not becoming a terrible person along the way. So, principles of competition. Principles of competition. Number one, the contest must be close. The contest must be close. The principle here is that a variety of studies from different experiences from the US Air Force Academy, people taking the SAT, uh, at corporate sales contests, all of these things come together to demonstrate that in order to get you competing at your best, the contest has to be close. Bronson and Merriman say the rule of thumb in research is that contests only work when it's an even matchup or a close race, such that the effort, extra effort becomes the decider between winning and losing. People need at least a fighting chance. When leaders are not challenged, they coast a little. Those too far behind stop trying as hard, lacking any sense that winning is feasible. So if you are you know, a varsity debater debating against a sixth grader in their first tournament, Presumably, you are not going to work very hard. You don't spend a bunch of time you know, cutting your politics updates to beat the sixth grade debate team at your school. Okay, You coach. At the same time, the sixth graders don't work very hard either because they see that they are debating you and they know that they're going to get killed and so they don't have any incentive to work harder because they don't believe that working hard will make a difference. How do you apply this in debate? How do you apply this in debate? First, you need to plan your season appropriately. Uh, this is why coaches generally don't send beginning debaters to their first tournament in varsity. And it would be pretty problematic if the first tournament of your career ever was like the Barkley Forum. You should select tournaments as much as possible with an eye toward keeping your debates close. Which doesn't mean you, know, you can't go to tournaments where there are people better than you or people worse than you. And it's certainly worth attending some <coughs> reach events. But as much as possible, you want to focus on every debate as one you can win if you give it your all. Seth Gannon, who many, most of you know, I think, I uh, did the lecture this morning, or the moderating this morning, refers to this as one debate at a time. You've got to take one debate at a time. I think he's talked to a bunch of different labs about this. But the only way that you can take it one debate at a time is if you have a relatively acceptable chance to win. Uh, my college coach, Ken Strange, director of debate at Dartmouth College, uh, used to talk to us about planning our season, especially when we were freshmen. It was like, what tournaments are you going to get to go to? And he would always say that he wanted to send us to tournaments where there was a pretty good chance that we could go 3-3 three, three, or 4-4, four, four, depending on how big the tournament, you know, how many rounds there were. And then if we worked harder, we could do one better than that when we're starting out. So if you're going to a bunch of tournaments where you're going to really struggle to go 1-6, that's probably not the right place for you. At the same time, 
If you go to a bunch of tournaments where you know that you are expected to win them, it's going to be a lot harder for you to work really hard for those tournaments. And obviously, you know, sometimes you do go to those tournaments to debate with the younger debater or that sort of thing. But as much as possible, you want to go to tournaments where you can do middle or better if you work hard enough, because it gives you that incentive to work hard. Number two. Number two, the size of the field matters. The size of the field matters. The principle here is that the more people who are participating in a task, the worse each of those people will do. The more people involved in a, in a debate tournament, the worse each of those debates are, relatively. The more people participating in a race, the worse each of the race times are. This is related to number one, which is that when you believe you have a chance, you turn up the competitive fire. But competition with hundreds or thousands of competitors makes it much easier to look around and be like, oh, I thought I had a chance, but there are 2,000 other debaters sitting in this cafeteria who also think that they're going to win this tournament. So it's harder to get fired up. Bonus study for those of you taking a standardized tests this year. Taking the SAT in a location where you're in a small room substantially increases your score. So if you have the opportunity to choose where you take the SAT, take it someplace where there aren't very many people, other people taking it. It is fascinating to me that this works, right? Because you all know that millions of students take the SAT. You all know that you're up taking it the same test as everyone else who's taking it on that same day in the country. And yet, when you get into the room and you look around and you see that there are 12 kids in the room, you're like, all right, I got a pretty good shot to do well on this stuff. And if you look around and see that there are a thousand other kids in the room, you're like, whoa, some of these people are probably a lot better than I am. Uh, and you don't work as hard, which seems crazy, but apparently true. How do you apply this in debate? Because you can't, you know, cough on a bunch of people before the tournament and make them sick and not come. At least, please don't. Uh, the way that you apply this in debate is to narrow your focus. Narrow your focus. What does that mean? It means going to a tournament, perhaps, to beat anyone who goes for the politics to set against you. That's your focus for that tournament. I'm going to beat anyone who goes for politics. Or maybe it's going to a tournament to beat a particular team or a particular school. The ultimate version of this strategy is the rivalry, where you have a particular team you are going for. I'm going to this tournament, and I want to beat this team. Now, obviously, you don't get to make the pairings, right? So maybe you never debate that team and then set. But when you go to a tournament or you set up a time where you want to beat a particular team and you focus on beating that particular team, the chances that you do so are increased substantial. Bronson and Merriman describe the importance of the rivalry in sports. They say there are always Cinderella stories in sports, but they're random. You never know when they're going to happen, except with rivalries. Rivalries seem to create reliable upsets. Rivalry is like competition squared. It fans the flames of competitive fire. Those of you who are among the best debaters in your area probably know that there are always teams that are sort of gunning for you. Um, and in those debates, you have to try way harder than you would otherwise. A team that you know usually is about 3-3 is all of a sudden debating you in the quarters, and you're fighting for your life. And the reason for that is because they have invested their whole tournament energy into beating you. Uh, and when they do that, it substantially increases their competitive fire. It substantially increases their desire to win, and you have to rise to meet the occasion. Lots of times, uh, especially at smaller tournaments, a really good national team might get upset by a team that doesn't have anywhere near as good of a record nationally. And the reason for that is because the lower ranked team came after them. They were like, this is the team we're going to beat this weekend, and we're going to do it at the Chattahoochee tournament. That, this is our weekend. And it, it seems to work. Number three. Number three. Home field advantage is a huge advantage. Home field advantage is a huge advantage. The principle. Studies of negotiating found that the first person to arrive in the room for the negotiation got up to 160% more in that negotiation. Showing up early got you 160% more. And it turns out you don't even need to get there very much early. The effect is so substantial that getting to the room even 30 seconds before the person that you're negotiating with seems to increase your ability to do well in that negotiation. And what is debate besides a negotiation? The advantage is stronger 
if the team uh, who has arrived first has already set up their stuff, they're like, you know, they've, they've staked out their turf. The advantage is stronger if the result seems uncertain, like at the beginning of the season when you're not really sure who's good or not, or if the teams haven't met before, never been in a team, you're not totally sure how that's gonna go, or if the early arriving team is behind early in the debate, they fight back harder. Why does this work? Most people think it works because people are territorial. And establishing your ground early makes you more competitive. You're more willing to challenge potential intruders. In the same way that if someone shows up in your dorm room, you're like, whoa, why are you in my dorm room? Please, please leave. And you try and get that invader out of there. Uh, the same thing appears to be true just arriving to the room a little bit before your opponent. You're more confident, you're more motivated, you're more aggressive. And all of those things lead to more victory. You are much more willing to be like, no, this round is mine, and you can't have it. How do you apply this in debate? There's the obvious. Get to the room faster. Get to the room faster. So those of you who uh, are a little bit slow to get to your debates, you're giving up you know, 160% of your negotiation. Uh, get to the room faster, and set up as fast as you can. The best scenario for you is that you are sitting there with your like table code all set up, you have your computer out, everything's plugged in, you have the table, right? If I got to this room first, I mean, clearly there's a huge advantage to getting here first, because I can take this, and then the people I'm debating against are sitting at these little tiny desks and trying to like arrange their laptops with their flows, it's terrible. So there's obviously the physical advantage, but if you get to the room and you have all of your stuff set up, there is a huge perceptual advantage to this is mine, you can't have. This is my room. We're going to be here. Sorry. Try again. You can get to the next room faster. Um, people are also really unlikely, especially in debates, uh, to ask the other team for things. So like if we were debating in this room, probably if I had set up, all, if, I, if you know, my partner and I got here first and set up all of our stuff, if you came in, it might be reasonable to be like, can we speak off of here? But you might not ask. And in rooms where it's just like a big table, and the first team to get there has taken the whole table, a lot of times I will see the other team like really awkwardly trying to push two of these desks together and put a table tote on top of it instead of just being like, can we have some of your table? And the reason for that is because you all have perceived that that's their table. They own it. So get to your room fast. The second thing, uh, like, oh yeah, please. So if we're in the reverse situation, would you recommend just going out and being like, oh, can I use the podium? Mm. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Uh, in Axe and Mother Game, and like, who can say no to that? Really, if we're in this room, and you came up and said, can I speak off up here? How terrible would I look as a human being? I'm like, no. No, sorry. I need all of it. I need all of this possible space. Yeah, for sure. Um, you should ask. Um, they can't really say no, especially if the judge is already there. They really can't say no then, right? Because it's like the judge is going to be like, seriously? I would probably say seriously, um, out loud and with disgust, if someone said no to that, because it's such a reasonable request. So yes, do ask, for sure. The second uh, way this applies to debate is in ELIMS. Uh, so what is the advantage of being the higher seed in the elimination round? You've got to face the lower seeds. Okay, well that, yes, for sure that. There's a different one though that relates to this. You get to stay yeah. in the room. You get to stay in the room. You get to stay in the room. Has anyone ever heard the phrase, in the door, out the door? Okay, this was something that my, my college partner was sort of obsessed with, which was that when we were, whenever we were in ELIMS, you always want to set up further away from the door. So this room has two doors, so it's hard to imagine that. But imagine uh, that it only had this door. We would set up like over here. Um, and the reason would be then the team would come in the door for the devils, and then they would go out the door. And then they would come, a new team would come in the door for the octas, and then they'd go out the door. The idea was, you know, you can keep coming in the door to face us, but we're over here, and we get to survey the whole room and watch, you know, the team for the devils come in and leave and go to you know, their Chipotle dinner. And then we get to watch the team for the Octus come in and beat them again and then leave. Um, and so the idea was that we would set up some place where we could survey the whole room and just like they would have to come in and face us immediately. And this sounded ridiculous to me at the time. I was like, really? Really, you cared that much about where we put the table? He would like drag tables over to the other side of the room and make sure we were informed by the door. Um, but it turns out that this is actually pretty true scientifically, that this thing that he you know, sort of intuited um, is true, that the more that you are set up in a place where you can sort of see the whole room uh, and survey things, and the more they have to take a terrible position, like along the wall or not facing the judge, um, the better off you are. 
So in this room, if I'm set up here and the judges are sitting here, uh, and the other team has to set up along this wall to get some space, there's a huge advantage to being like, I'm the front of the room, people. Uh, there was a debate tournament I attended in high school. I attended the Omaha West Side Tournament, which is a three-day tournament. Uh, and I don't really remember why. My partner was sick, or maybe she had like some sprained ankle or something. Uh, but we got to be in the same room from round one through the final. Okay, so it was like we got there, and it was like, this is your room. You will be here until you are no longer in the tournament. Uh, and over the course of the three days, uh, it was a huge advantage because we knew where the room was, so we were always there first, right? The school was very confusing. The numbering was like all over the place. But we knew how to get from the cafeteria to our room, you know, just the same way you know how to get from your dorm room to the ICC. But everyone else was wandering all around looking for this room, uh, and so they lost a bunch of prep time. And there was the added benefit of every time they had to come into our room and they had to leave immediately after. Um, and I don't think it's a total coincidence that we won that tournament and were very much not expected to do so, um, that we, over the course of the days, people had to keep coming to us. It was like our turf. By the end of the weekend, we'd like set up all of our stuff. I mean, we basically decorated this English classroom. Um, and that turns out to be a pretty big advantage. So get there fast. Take advantage of your higher seed. I, I say this, and it's like sometimes I'm a tournament director, and I it's my job to go to the higher seat and be like, actually, we need you to move rooms because this room isn't ideal, or we didn't schedule this room right, or uh, uh, you know, we need to clean it or whatever. So don't don't be a meanie and be like, nope, we're keeping our room. I'm the top seat. You can't make me move. Um, but there is an advantage to keeping that room, and, and don't forget. Okay, number four. Number four. Spectators influence outcomes. Spectators influence outcomes. The principle, performing in front of spectators, especially those you care about, like a friend or a family member, can increase your performance in some situations. In other situations, it makes you worse. Here's the difference. A professor at the University of Michigan named Robert, uh, I don't know how to say it, Zajonk, I think, Z-A-J-O-N-C, uh, basically determine that the difference between when spectators help you and when spectators hurt you is whether you are learning something or whether you've already mastered the thing. And if you're learning it for the first time, having people watch you makes you much, much worse. It doesn't really matter what it is. It should be a video game where someone's sitting there silently. But having somebody watch you do something for the first time makes you worse. You get nervous. You're already underconfident because you know you don't know how to do this thing. Um, learning is very stressful, and so having someone watch you while you're learning turns out to be overwhelmingly stressful and you sort of crumble. However, once you have mastered that skill, once you've practiced it a little bit and feel a little bit more confident, having spectators substantially increases your performance. <coughs> How to apply this in debate? How to apply this in debate? First is practice alone. It doesn't mean always practice alone, but the first time you read the 1AC doesn't have to be in front of the lab. It can be in your dorm room, maybe just in front of your roommate or no one. When you're doing a rebuttal rework, practice it yourself a few times before you go back and give it in front of your lab leader. I told the debaters in my lab that if they wanted to do a rebuttal or redo, uh, that they had to practice it three times for themselves and once, at least once with their partner before they came back. And part of that is like, you know, I, I really want you to actually work on this, not just like give the same speech to me again. That doesn't get you any better. But the other reason um, is because by the time that they then come back in front of the judge, they will be more confident and more fired up ready to give this speech. But once, you, once you're good at it, once you've done the thing a couple times, once you've read the 1AC a few times, given the 2AC a few times, bring in spectators to watch your debate. Most of the best debates happen in Elon. And part of that is obviously because the best teams debate each other in elims. But these people debate each other all the time. Uh, and they debate each other in prelims all the time. And still often people say that the best debate occurred you know, in the quarters of the Northwestern Tournament College or you know, the semis of the NDCA Tournament. And part of that is because there are people watching. They hold you accountable and you want to do your best for them. This is also true even for things like giving a lecture. So last night I did this lecture for my lab. Uh, and I was a little nervous about it. I was like, oh, I, you know, I haven't done this lecture before. I'm, I'm a little nervous. Uh, and I certainly wouldn't have wanted to be filmed doing that lecture last night. It's like, whoa, that's scary. Preserving it for all time, all the mistakes I made. 
But today, doing it again for the second time, not only am I more confident about it, but I was like, all right, let's film this. Let's bring it on, film camera. We can record this one for posterity. Um, and well, I don't actually, you know, I can't measure whether it's actually better. Uh, the scientific studies would suggest that the presence of all of you plus the presence of the camera requires me to do better than I would if I was just doing this for one of you or none. But why I would give a lecture to myself about the science of winning on our lecture. But bring in people to watch. Um, and I think uh, consider letting your friends and family occasionally watch you debate. Um, I, I fight this fight with my debaters all the time, which is that uh, from the very first day you debate, your parents are emailing me to ask when they can come watch you debate. Okay. Like day one, they're like, all right, you know, Sam's going to his first debate term, and I get an email from Sam's mom, I'm like, come on. Uh, and what I generally say, uh, which was mostly just sort of a gut reaction, but turns out to be scientifically supported, is like, don't come to the first tournament. Don't come to this poor novice's first tournament. They don't know what they're doing. They'll feel foolish debating in front of you. They won't know what's going on, uh, and they'll feel very stressed about that. But by the time you get to be a junior or senior, Consider letting your parents come to a couple of tournaments. Consider letting your sibling come, or your friend who doesn't do debate, come to a tournament or two. And, if you're being really strategic about it, make it a tournament where you really want to do well. So if you really want to win the Harvard tournament, consider letting your parents come to the Harvard tournament. If you really want to win the state tournament, invite your parents. Be like, come watch us in the Elims of State. You will step up your game unconsciously, and it will make a big difference in your performance. Number five. Number five, near losses are as important as near wins. Near losses are as important as near wins. The principle, a near loss is when you won, but maybe you shouldn't have. It's when you got lucky. Uh, and in debate, that's often reflected in the low point win. Near wins or when you lost, but maybe you should have won. You got unlucky, and sometimes that's a high point loss in a bit. People have a tendency to get very overconfident after an event where they got lucky. So what happens is you win a close debate, and then you forget that the outcome could have just as easily gone the other way. You sort of revise history, to make it seem like you were really skilled and thoughtful and awesome, and the other team was just like terrible. And you forget that it was really just that you were sort of randomly fortunate. This is known as near miss bias. Near miss bias. The problem with that is what happens afterwards. When you lose, you tend to examine that loss to see what went wrong. So, you know, if you come out of your debate and you lost, you're going to go to your coach and be like, oh, we lost. And the coach is going to be like, what happened? And you're going to say, well, here's what we did, and here's what they did, and here's what the judge said about why we lost. And then you'll spend, you know, your ride to dinner talking about that. Maybe you keep talking about that loss, how you could beat them the next time, what work needs to be done. And all of that is extremely important toward winning your next debate, and the debate after that, and the debate after that. The problem is that when you get lucky and win, you tend to just come out of the debate and be like, hey, we won. And your coach is like, great, let's go to Chipotle. Um, and then you don't do all of that work to scrutinize all the ways you could have lost, all of the ways that the judge maybe gave you the benefit of the doubt, the fact that the only reason you won was because the 2NR messed something up and you were actually way behind in the middle of the debate. And all of those things are the things that lead you to get better in debate. A couple of real world examples that I thought were interesting and entertaining. The first uh, is a sad one, which is that NASA knew for years that whenever they launched a shuttle, foam would fall off the tanks and just like fly into the air. Okay, there were pieces of foam would fall off the shuttle uh, and fly into the air. Uh, but it had never been a problem, so they're like, okay, you know, I guess foam falls off when we launch shuttles. But then 2003 came along. What happened to NASA in 2003? Shuttle return. Hmm? Columbia. 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 Uh, yeah. 2003 was Columbia. Challenger was not during election. Um, Columbia happens in 2003, where Columbia launches, some foam flies off. But this time, instead of hitting nothing, or hitting nothing important, uh, it hit something very important, and the shuttle exploded on re-entry. 
Uh, and this is one of those examples of where not scrutinizing what went wrong, even though the, the mission, previous missions were successful, led to massive overconfidence because they believe, well, it's never hit anything, not, not a big deal before, we don't need to do very much about it. Instead, they needed to realize that they had gotten incredibly lucky over the years, that prior to 2003, this foam had continued to fall off and not hit anything important. It's a space shuttle. Presumably almost everything is important. So instead of thinking of themselves as skilled, they needed to think of themselves as lucky and look for the mistakes. Second example I think I like even better. Uh, it's about FedEx. Uh, and, and I might mess up the retelling a little bit, but I'll get the gist of it right, which is that when FedEx is starting as a company, uh, there was a point at which, when it was a very tiny little company, um, the head of FedEx basically ran out of money. They had like, invested a bunch in the com company, and all of a sudden, they, had, they hadn't gotten some money that they were expecting, and all of a sudden, it's time to make payroll. They have to pay all of their people, and he doesn't have the money. Okay. So he's heading back to Nashville to basically shut the company down. He's like, I can't make payroll. Turns out people don't work when you don't pay them. Um, so he's going to have to shut down the company. Uh, but instead of going to Nashville, he goes to Vegas. Uh, and in a night in Vegas, manages to make the $30,000 he needed uh, in blackjack. Okay. <laughs> so then he makes his $30,000 playing blackjack, goes back to Nashville, pays his workers, uh, and then you know FedEx happens. Seems like it worked out pretty well for him. But there's one version of this story that's like, wow, that was totally awesome. This guy like went to Vegas and he made the money and now he has FedEx and I'm sure he's like a billionaire. Uh, it sounds like a wonderful story. The other version of the story, if you look a little closer, is that FedEx almost didn't exist because of some hands of blackjack, right? It's not that often that someone's like, I'm gonna go make a bunch of money in Vegas on blackjack and it actually works, right? It's far, far, far more likely uh, that this would have been a catastrophic error, then this, this is the incredible strategy that creates FedEx. But by seeing that as success instead of luck, you don't scrutinize those questions. So how do you apply this in debate? This is pretty obvious. Examine your wins. Examine your wins. Talk to your coaches about your wins. We won this debate, but here are all of the things we did badly. Examine your wins. See where you made those mistakes. See where you can do better. Take as good or better judge notes when you win as when you lose. How many of you have ever been judged by someone uh, who didn't tell you whether you won or lost until the end of the decision? How crazy did that drive you? Very? Yeah. Uh, there's the, the reason that judges don't do this is because you all look at us like you want us to die. Um, but the reason that some judges persist in doing this is to avoid this near-miss bias. It's to get you to take notes because you don't know what's going to happen. And while the outcome is still uncertain, you're very interested in what you could do better, right? Because you might have lost. So you're like taking notes very carefully, you're listening, you're like, did he hint that we won? Did he hint that we lost? Did she, you know, suggest that she voted affirmative? Um, and all of that works uh, because you don't know yet whether you've won or lost. Once the judge says, congratulations, uh, you have won the debate, you are very likely to be like, and then you switch over to Gchat and start telling you know, your friends that you won this awesome debate, um, and you stop listening to the judges. And instead, you need to be listening even more closely. The other thing you need to do um, is to ask your judges to tell you what you did wrong even when you won. You don't need to be obnoxious about it, okay? And if it's a situation where like the other team is sitting there crying or something, you probably don't want to be like, can you tell me all the things that I could do better? While well, you know, they sit there pouring their hearts out. But um, in most debates, the stakes are not that high, and the judge is perfectly willing to tell you things that you did wrong. I, I'm not sure I've ever judged a debate where I would be like, the, the team that won was perfect. I don't have anything to say to them. But sometimes I might forget to tell them all of those things because I am analyzing the reasons for the decision as opposed to things they could have done better. I mean, you know, you could win all of the reasons for the decision. Maybe you killed on the nexus issues, but did poorly in other parts of the debate. So be, don't be afraid to ask your judges. The other thing is if you're uncomfortable doing this, um, feel free to send them an email. Most judges have their email addresses on their judge philosophies, or it's really easy to find uh, their email address if you search for their name and Gmail, because, you know, Gmail. Um, but if you ever send a judge an email and say, you know, I really appreciate your decision. I thought it was really thoughtful. I was wondering what things I can do better to, you know, continue to do better next time. No one thinks that that's terrible. Everyone thinks that's pretty awesome. And maybe we don't respond right away. Like if you email me Elim Day of St. Mark's, 
it's probably going to take me like a week to get back for you because I will feel like I want to die for the rest of that week. But um, other than that, judges will respond. So consider emailing them. Your opponent, who you just beat, is analyzing their loss, right? Uh, and so if you don't take the opportunity to analyze your win, they're much more likely to win the next time around. They've spent a lot of time figuring out what they did wrong and what they need to do better. So, uh, you know, don't, don't miss your opportunity to do the same. Number six. Number six. Anxiety isn't a problem. Anxiety isn't a problem. The principle. Contrary to popular belief, being anxious isn't a disaster, and it isn't a sign that you aren't prepared. Many incredibly good competitors are always very nervous. I'm going to use Seth as another example here, um, because when he came to our lab the other day, uh, he was talking about how he gets very anxious speaking in front of a group. Okay, and when he said that, I was like, Seth Gannon is afraid of speaking in front of a group? Like, I've known Seth since he was like 15 years old. I've seen him debate in dozens of debates. I've seen him give dozens of lectures. I think he's wonderful and one of the best lecturers I know. And he gets terrified speaking in front of a group of high schoolers. Uh, and what that led me to recognize was not that Seth is some sort of like mystery, magic, wonderful person, although he is all of those things. Um, it's that very anxious people can still perform. He can still be one of the best lecturers that you will hear a lecture from, even if he's terrified of all of you. And he's terrified of standing up in front of a crowd and doing it. Turns out that it's mostly amateurs who are afraid of anxiety, whereas professionals in sports, in things like debate, in music, tend to view it as beneficial. So amateurs are like, oh my goodness, I'm anxious. This is terrible. This must mean that I don't know how to do this. And then they get caught up in the cycle of like, well, gosh, I don't know how to do this, this thing, and I don't know how to do this thing, and I don't know how to do this thing. This is so terrible. I just want to quit. I don't want to do this anymore. Professionals, on the other hand, tend to realize that an anxiety can be beneficial. They recognize that they're anxious. They also know that they're well prepared, right? So it's like, I'm, I'm anxious, but I don't know how to debate. I've given a 2AC before. What are they possibly going to say? It's going to be fine. And so they're not hurt by the anxiety. They just note that they're anxious and then they move on. When you consider the research on anxiety and performance, it turns out that the overall level of anxiety doesn't matter that much. Instead, the impact on performance is very individual. It's very person dependent. Some people actually perform much better when they're nervous. This guy named Yuri Hannon, who's a Russian psychologist, I uh, came up with this idea called the Individual Zone of Optimal Function, the IZOF, Individual Zone of Optimal, optimal Function. And he said that there is sort of a set level of anxiousness for each of you that is most beneficial to your performance. And as it turns out, that that's not that different from your level of anxiety in everyday life. So the person who's like super chill, doesn't really worry about lots of most things, they're not worried about their tests, they're not worried about getting hit by a car on the way to lab, they're not worried that just because someone didn't respond to your text message it means they're dead. Um, that person, they're probably not going to be very anxious in debates either. And, and you know, being really anxious wouldn't help them very much. They're just, you know, they go through life pretty chill and they go through debate pretty chill. And, you know, if they're an Olympian badminton player, they go through that Olympics in badminton pretty chill. For people who are chronically anxious, though, the people who are more nervous in everyday life, being more anxious in a competitive environment doesn't hurt you. Okay, so ratcheting up the anxiety level doesn't actually make everything worse. So if you're one of those people, it's like, you are worried all of the time. And let's be clear, I am definitely one of those people. Like, I can think of like 500 things that could go wrong just during this lecture, okay? If you're one of those people that thinks about all the things that could go wrong in every moment, or is, you know, relatively nervous about tests, you're relatively nervous about, you know, taking the SAT, you're relatively nervous that if you ask that girl or boy to prom, they're gonna say no. For you, being really anxious about debate isn't that big of a deal. You're just, you're anxious. That's who you are, and that's okay. And in fact, if you were to be really unanxious about a debate, it would probably hurt you. Because your system is very used to functioning at a high level of anxiety, and you need a high level of anxiety to perform at your best. So how do you apply this in a debate? First, you need to reframe how you interpret stress. 
the, there's this great example of this SAT study um, where on the front page of the SAT, I think, I don't know, I'm not sure if it's the actual SAT or version of it, but in any case, very high stakes standardized test. On the front page, half of the people were just given, you know, a regular test. They took their test. And the other half of the people were given a little note. It was like a little box on the front. And the box said, uh, basically, you may notice that you're feeling very anxious right now. But don't worry. The anxiety that you're feeling is just your body's way of gearing up to do something difficult. This isn't a problem. Feeling anxious right now doesn't hurt your performance and may actually help you. Okay, so the only difference is like one of you gets a little box telling you it's okay. Uh, and it turns out that, well, the people who saw the little box didn't calm down. Okay, they didn't get less anxious. In fact, their stress hormone levels went up upon seeing the box. Okay, they were like, oh, I am really anxious right now. Oh my goodness. They did much better on the SAT. So simply by realizing that being anxious doesn't hurt you, they were able to do better despite getting even more anxious. So that first one for debate is just, that, that's super easy, right? When you are standing, you know, you're about to have your first ELIM debate in front of an audience, perhaps, or you're about to have your first debate up on a stage. I, the first time I did that, I thought, that terrifying when you're looking down at people. Or you're about to have your first finals debate at a tournament where everyone's watching. Maybe your first day where your principal comes and watch. That one's always a little weird. All of those things are very stress-inducing because they are scary. Okay? And so you don't need to tell yourself, don't be scared. Right? Because how well does that work? Whenever I tell myself, don't be scared, it just reminds me of all the things that I'm scared of. It's like, my body, my, I start, my brain starts fighting back. And it's like, no, I should be scared. This is scary. This is, there's this thing and this thing and this thing and this thing. Instead, tell yourself, it's cool to be scared. It's totally fine to be scared. In fact, the fact that I am feeling stress and anxiety is making me channel more energy into my debate. It's getting me ramped up for the debate and I'm ready to go. The second thing you need to do uh, is to practice harder than you play. Who's ever heard practice like you play? Yeah, coaches love to say this, which is like when you're like, for this practice to make, can I give it sitting down? And the coach is like, no, practice like you play, stand up. Okay, or for just this one practice debate, can I flow on the computer instead of paper? It's like, no, practice like you play. You have to practice what we're doing in the debate. This one is a little different, uh, and it is practice harder than you play. You need to make practice very stressful and anxiety-inducing, which will then teach you that you can still work and still do well, even when you're really anxious, even when you're really stressed. Has anyone ever heard of someone named Anson Dorrance? Clearly none of you are women's college soccer fans, which I'm not at. But uh, this, this guy, Anson Dorrance, uh, is the women's soccer coach at the University of North Carolina. And he's been the women's soccer coach for over 30 years. Uh, and in those 30 years, uh, the team has won 21 national championships. Okay, So 30 years, 21 national championships. He's clearly doing some things right. In fact, uh, many people think that he is the most successful coach in college history in any sport of any, at any level. So college coach, most successful. Uh, and what he does um, is make the practices ruthlessly stressful. So he is trying to acclimate the people on his team to how hard the games are going to be plus some. Who's ever been in a sport where you have to like run much further for the practices than you ever have to do in a game or like do the thing more times? Yes, I mean, dude, what, what sport did you like? Country. Okay, tell me about cross country. Uh, I like actually know a little about that, but I don't want anything about other sports. So tell me about cross country. Well, the races are only like three miles usually, but we have to run many, many times further than three miles. Yeah, why do you have to do that? So that you are, I mean, for different reasons, but so that your muscles and lungs get better at running and you over practice the thing you're actually doing. Um, yeah, exactly right. You over practice so that by the time you get to the performance, that three miles is like three miles? That's nothing. That's an easy day. And then you can give all your energy into doing it right. So the easy one to do this for a debate is speaking drills. You should be speaking for far longer than eight minutes all the time. Okay, if you're doing speaking drills and you warm up for five minutes, well, it's like that's, that's lovely if you were giving a three-minute speech. But you don't. You give eight-minute speeches in debate. Uh, and I, in practice debates this summer, have commented on, um, I would say at least 50% of them, that it's like, you started out really fast and clear. And then about four minutes in, it was like you started trailing off and you lost the ability to keep up that energy. And the reason is because you're just not acclimated to it. You didn't run the 10 miles, so you can run three miles. 
debate, that means you need to practice reading for 12 or 15 minutes so that you can be awesome at reading for 8 minutes. It also means that you need to be doing all sorts of other things to make your practices harder. So have practice debates where no one discloses and like you read a new app and the other members of your team, you know, you don't know what's going to happen. Have practice debates where you have to give a rebuttal that's only four minutes long and they get all of their speech time. Have practice debates where you don't get very much prep time. Who's done this one? I love this one. But like, you get three minutes of prep time for the practice debate. That will really teach you that eight minutes is a lot of time, right? Eight, when you go back to eight, if you've been doing three or five, it's like, huh, I fall this time. By making practices harder and more stressful than your actual tournaments, you become used to the stress uh, so that it doesn't overwhelm you. How many of you have heard of Frank Sieber? Anyone heard of him? Okay. Do you know, you know where I used to coach? It's okay. Uh, he used to coach at Woodward Academy. He had my job uh, before I had it and then before the person before me had it. Two people ago. Uh, and one of the things that he was obsessed with, and I think obsessed is definitely the right word, um, is acclimating the debaters to the exact thing that they would be experiencing um, on the day of the tournament. And some of these things were a little absurd, but my favorite one, because it just shows you how far you can take this, um, is that the tournament that he most wanted to win was the Barkley Forum at Emory University. Okay? Uh, that, that was just like what? That was, that was the capstone of the season. That was the one he wanted. Um, and Woodward Academy is in Atlanta, which is where Emory is. And so what he would do um, is that at least once, and perhaps more than once, I'm not totally sure on the exact history of the set, um, he would rent out the White Hall Auditorium, which is where the practice space were, or the Wish Cab Auditorium, the, the room that the finals was going to be in, and make the debaters practice in there. Okay, so uh, for those of you who have been to the Barkley Forum tournament, uh, the finals are in a giant auditorium, like five times bigger than the one we have our morning lecture in. Okay, um, and so he was, he was pretty convinced uh, that the first time the debaters would be there, and you're up on a really big stage, first time the debaters would be there would be like, there are so many people. They're all out there. They're all watching me, and the stage is big, and you have to project loudly, right? You get a microphone, and it's like you gotta reach. There's a balcony. Who's ever been in a room that had a balcony? I mean, that's pretty impressive. Uh, and so he would rent out, reserve from Emory University, that auditorium, a couple of weeks before the, tur to the tournament, and make the debaters go have a practice debate there, so that by the time his debaters were on stage uh, in the finals, they would have been there before. And it was the other team that was like, the stage is really big. Uh, and, that, and that was an incredibly successful strategy. So, practice hard and you play. Yeah? Is there, like, any danger that if you, like, get, like, too used to anxiety and you're like, well, like, this isn't a problem at all, like, that you then become not anxious and then, like, it just kind of fails? It's a good question. Um, I think for the most part, as long as you are still very interested in the outcome of the debate, that it will still work. When we get to number nine, um, we're going to talk about times in which you don't get excited enough for your debates and then it becomes a problem. Uh, for the most part, people who are anxious uh, will mostly stay anxious um, and that they just get better at coping with that anxiety. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I mean, I guess it, the, there is a possibility that it's just like if you're no longer interested in your debates or you just like don't care about the outcome anymore, uh, you probably won't get as anxious and it won't work for you. But most of the time, you will still be anxious and it will still work pretty well. Okay, number seven. Positive thinking is dangerous. Positive thinking is dangerous. The principle, when I, when I first thought of this one, I was like, really? I'm so happy. I love positive thinking. Like everyone's wonderful. I think all of you are delightful. We're so happy to be at debate camp. Uh, you know, every speech is a great speech. Okay, not all of that is quite true. But uh, as it turns out, that that's okay. Because positive thinking can be dangerous. When you're trying to be the best competitor possible, thinking happy thoughts will actually hurt you. Because when you try to avoid thinking of negative things, right? So in order to think happy things, you have to be like, I can't think of anything sad. You lose the opportunity to think critically about how your performance and how you can do better, which is exactly what you need to do in order to actually do better. The second problem with this like ruthless, happy thinking um, is that fantasies kill motivation. So when you spend a bunch of time picturing how exciting it's going to be to be at the state tournament awards assembly getting handed that awesome giant trophy, 
Uh, some states have like pretty small trophies, but some of them are really big. And Georgia's is not that big, but it's super heavy. Um, so it's like, it takes two people to like hoist that thing up in the air. It's like, if you spend much time picturing hoisting that trophy above your head, um, it turns out that you are actually a lot less motivated to do the things that you need to do in order to get that trophy. Instead, try yourself on your mistakes, be like, oh, shouldn't have done that. And then move on. And it tends to make you a better overall performer. Simply telling yourself that you're wonderful doesn't actually make you any more wonderful. So, please don't let the takeaway from that be like you go home and only tell yourself sad things about yourself. Like, I'm so terrible at debate. I can't do anything right. I always drop things in the 2AC and then my 2 ARs aren't persuasive. That's not the take-home message. The take-home message is that you need to think about what you've done right. Congratulate yourself for that. But also think about what you did wrong and make sure that you're still working on it. How to apply this in debate. One of the things that's really important when trying to reach a goal, and uh, you know, the whole debate season is just a set of goals, right? You want to do well at this tournament, you want to do well at this tournament, maybe you want to be in contention for the baker. Uh, there are all sorts of things that you can do that can be little goals along the way. You need to think about the obstacles you're, you will encounter along the way to reaching that goal. You need to be very specific. So you need to think, if I want to win the state tournament, here are all the things that are going to stand in my way. Okay, It's going to be really hard because I'm also taking AP US history, and we have a test three days before the state tournament prepping for that midterm. It's going to be really hard to do that and still prep for state. You need to think about, uh, you know, it's going to be really difficult because I know that my partner um, is also a very good singer, and so she misses practice a lot to go to singing competition. You need to think, it's going to be really difficult because I know my parents sometimes get angry with me when I'm doing too much debate work. Okay? So you need to think about all the things that are going to stand in your way. And then, you need to think about what you will do as a result. And you need to be very specific there, too. So, when I encounter the problem that my debate partner can't go to a bunch of tournaments or can't go to a bunch of practices because she has singing practice, I will talk to my coach about scheduling additional practices before school, perhaps, when she can come. Or when my parents get on my case because they think that I'm spending too much time on debate, I will remind them that I am, you know, I've cut back on my socializing so that I can do more debate. Or when I realize that I have an AP US history test three days before the state tournament, I know I'm going to need to be studying AP US history all along so I don't have to cram for that test. The best way to actually reach a goal is to think about the things that will get in your way and then plan a strategy for dealing with them because you will have things that get in your way. Whatever your goal is, whether it's big, winning the state tournament, or whether it's little, you just like want to win you know, more debates on the app, or you want to go to a particular tournament, you want your coach to pick you for a particular tournament, there will be things that cause problems along the way. And people who only think about how great their goal is, they like spend a bunch of time thinking about how excited they'll be when they accomplish their goal, tend to fall apart when they encounter their first obstacle. Because they just picture themselves like cruising to victory. It's like, no one can stop me now, I am so wonderful. Uh, and then all of a sudden, someone can stop you and you're like, whoa, I guess maybe I'm not meant to win the state tournament. You're just kind of give up. <coughs> Instead, think about what is going to happen to make disasters happen and then figure out how you're going to fix it. The other thing you can do uh, is in debates, which is that you should anticipate making mistakes in debates and then strategize for how you'll respond to them. So instead of telling yourself, I am never going to drop conditionality because I am delightful and perfect and, you know, I can flow, which hopefully all of you are in hand. Um, instead, you need to be thinking to yourself, what will I do when I drop conditionality? What will I do if, uh, you know, my partner drops a dis at the 2AC? Or they, uh, the 2NC doesn't notice that there's like a, an add-on somewhere in the debate? Scenario plan for yourself. What should happen in those debates? And then talk to your coaches too, right? Like coaches are all there, they like to help you. Uh, and one way they can help you is by helping you plan for making mistakes. So instead of thinking, I never make mistakes, I'm never gonna make a mistake, the solution is not to ever make a mistake. Uh, plan for making those mistakes and figure out how, what you're gonna do in the debate. Number eight, counterfactuals are motivated. 
Counterfactuals are motivated. What's a counterfactual? Mm -hmm. I should have done this instead of what I actually did. Yeah, um, it's, it's thinking about what could have been and then what would have happened as a result. So historians love these, like, you know, what would have happened if the South had won the Civil War? And then they, like, project what would have happened after that. Or what would have happened if the U.S. had gotten involved in World War II sooner? And then project what would have happened after that. And some people think that uh, when you're being personally motivated or when you're trying to do something, you should never think about what could have been. All right? Who's ever heard just like, yesterday's in the past, let it go, get away from it? But it turns out that that's actually not the best strategy. Uh, it turns out to be how you think about what might have been that makes the difference, rather than whether you're thinking about what might have been. This professor uh, from the University of California, Berkeley, named Laura Cray, came up with this distinction between additive counterfactuals and subtractive counterfactuals. An additive counterfactual is what you could have done but didn't do. It's something that didn't happen because you didn't do something. So think about what you could have done. What could I have done here? What could I have done here? What could I have done here? Subtractive counterfactuals are trying to eliminate something that did happen. So the example uh, that she gives is about basketball. She says the additive counterfactual is if only I had driven toward the hoop. Okay, if only I had decided to go for the hoop. The subtractive counterfactual is if only I hadn't missed that shot. It takes something that did exist and tries to eliminate it. In debate, there's a million of these. So the additive counterfactual is like, if only I had cross-applied answers from topicality when I dropped conditionality. If only I had you know, explained that the case outweighed more thoroughly so that the judge understood that argument. If only I had practiced being, you know, I had been more clear when I was explaining this argument. The subtractive versions are like, if only I didn't drop conditionality. Gosh, we would have won the tournament if only I didn't drop conditionality. Gosh, we would have won the tournament if only we hadn't debated this team in the quarters. Ugh, that's terrible. Uh, and subtractive counterfactuals are like trying to eliminate things that actually did happen, right? Uh, and those are the ones that don't help you at all. Okay, it doesn't help you to be like, well, how much better would my life have been if we had drawn a different team to debate in the doubles, and then we wouldn't have lost in the doubles. But it helps your life and your debate skills a lot if you spend time thinking about what other strategies you could have taken in the debate and what would have likely happened. So if you're thinking to yourself, if only I had gone for politics instead of pink tie, that causes you to then start thinking strategically, right? You're like, okay, well, if I'd gone for politics, that would have changed the 1AR like this, and then I probably could have said this, and now the 2AR is going to say this other thing, and ooh, maybe I'm in a better position. Or maybe you discover it's like, oh, that would actually have been terrible. Pink tie was the right strategy there. But both of those versions cause you to think about what you would have done, and it causes you to get excited about all of the options in debate, right? Debate is like choose your own adventure. At every point in the debate, uh, you have a million choices to make, and each one of those choices changes the whole relative course of the debate. Right? I can read this card or this card or no card at all. I can extend this case argument. I can kick this advantage. I can spend this much time on topicality. I could you know, tell my partner to take conditionality or I can take conditionality. We could extend the K. We could kick the K. There's a million choices in every debate. And that's only once the debate started. There's thousands more if you factor in all the strategy planning and all that stuff before the debate. And all of those things cause you to think really strategically about how debates work and what you can do better or worse. So whenever you think about what you could have done, you're putting yourself in a critical thinking point of view. And you're doing exactly what you need to do in order to fix the problem the next time, right? Whenever you spend time thinking about, you know, here's what I could have done when the AF read that add-on that we didn't have answers to, the next time the AF reads an add-on that you don't have answers to, you have already had those thoughts. Yeah, you had a question? Yeah. Um I'm just a bit confused about the difference between additive and subtractive. Yeah. Uh, go, go ahead. Like, I mean, I think I might have an idea. It's like, is it like additive was like a choice you made but like didn't do something, and like subtractive is like you tried to do something but just failed? Pretty close. Uh, additive is something that didn't happen but could have happened. 
Whereas subtractive is trying to get rid of something that happened. So, you know, dropping conditionality is something that happened. Being like, I really wish I hadn't dropped conditionality is not useful for you because it's like, well, obviously you wish you hadn't dropped conditionality. Whereas thinking about, I wish that I had instead done this other, I wish that when I dropped conditionality, I had done this other thing, causes you to think about how you respond to a problem. Does that make sense? So like subtractive counterfactuals are wishing away your problems in the past. That's probably, I guess, the best way to think about it. Subtractive counterfactual is like, I wish I hadn't had this problem. Whereas an additive counterfactual is like, I wish I had responded to this problem in a different way. Was that better? No, I'll put that in the next one. Okay, number nine. This might be my favorite one. Testosterone matters a lot. Testosterone matters a lot. The principle. Part of how much competitive drive you have comes from all sorts of things that you don't think you have very much control over. And a number of studies have predicted that increases in testosterone predict competition levels. This is one of my favorite studies that I've ever read. There's a study of these chess competitors, okay? Uh, they're going to a chess tournament. Uh, and the researchers have them spit into a cup before their first chess match. And when you spit into a cup, you can like test people's hormone levels, okay? Um, and what they did is they had all the people in this chess tournament spit into a cup, and they checked their testosterone levels, and they plotted it next to how well they did in the tournament. And it turns out that the researchers could have predicted before the tournament started how everyone was going to do just based on their testosterone level, which is just crazy. It's like, it's chess. Like, how much testosterone do you need to play chess? It's not like they were, you know, wrestling or like, I don't know, sword fighting. It's chess. But the people who did very well in the tournament got way more of a boost from their baseline than the people uh, who didn't. There is someone, I think, at Emory University trying to like sort of apply this to debaters. I don't know very many details about this other than uh, that they often have the debaters spit in a cup before tournaments and then they like go somewhere. I don't think that anyone has actually released any of this. Um, but anticipating the next couple of years of you know a fascinating study of testosterone levels in Emory University debaters uh, before their debates. Uh, this guy, a professor at the University of Nebraska named Alan Booth, who's done a bunch of research in testosterone and competition, says. Uh, that that testosterone boosts performance for elite surgeons and chess masters every bit as much as it does for weightlifters and home run hitters is changing how science has regarded the steroid. I like to think of testosterone as intensity, not aggression, he says. It increases the intensity with which someone approaches an activity, and it increases their response to a challenge. So testosterone seems to work in two different ways. Um, the first is that it increases your intensity and desire to fulfill your goal. And the second is that it decreases your fear response that comes from doing something really scary, right? Competing is scary. It is reasonable to be scared. Testosterone sort of makes you more immune to the negative effects of being scared. And actually, far from making people like too aggressive or too emotional, it seems to actually increase the ability to keep emotions from interfering with what you're trying to do. It also seems to make people care uh, more and in increase about teamwork because people care more about what other people think about them. So someone who really wants to be valued on their soccer team will play more uh, cooperatively when they have a higher boost of testosterone. Okay, for those of you who are like, when I'm a girl, that doesn't seem very fair. Uh, that, it, it, no, never fear, uh, it turns out that this is all based on baseline levels and increases over the baseline. So what does that mean for you? It means that if you have a relatively high level of testosterone, you need a higher boost of it in order to do get your performance boost. If you have a relatively low level of testosterone, you know, like you're the 50% of the population that's a girl, um, then you don't need very much more in order to get that boost in performance. And actually, uh, studies of women tennis players, soccer players, volleyball, and badminton players reveal uh, that, that women who are in competitions get the exact same testosterone boost as men. Um, and it seems to have the same effect in both men and women. So that's kind of cool. How do you apply this in debate? Uh, the important thing here seems to be recognizing the challenge. You need to recognize something as a challenge in order to get the boost in testosterone. If you don't care about the result, you're not going to get a boost, and then thus you won't perform better. Bronson and Merriman explain. Competitors learn to recognize a future contest. And their minds need to mark it as a salient challenge in order for the testosterone response to kick in. For instance, 
Booth's Chess Club members, those ones that he had studied, the way your testosterone predicted the result. Booth's Chess Club members also played in a city tournament that was far less prestigious and far less meaningful to the players. In that case, very few of the players got the anticipatory response. Almost none of them were taking it very seriously, and so their testosterone levels didn't predict their performance. In particular, picturing the struggle seems to give you the needed response. This may be part of why positive thinking fails that we just talked about. That if you don't see yourself encountering obstacles and fighting back, you won't get a boost. Your body gives you a boost in testosterone in order to fight back against obstacles. And so if you just picture yourself just like winning the debate because you won every argument in the debate, you're not going to get fired up about the debate in the same way you would otherwise. But instead, if you picture a very close debate, if you picture having to give every little bit of energy and debate skill and everything you learned at debate camp in order to win that debate, your body will start producing testosterone immediately before the debate. This may be also why the, the chess player study seems to correlate pretty well to debate where sometimes really good debaters don't do very well at certain tournaments. Uh, and it turns out it's mostly because they don't care very much about that tournament. So like a debater will debate sometimes, debate really, really hard at a tournament they desperately want to win. And then it's like there's one their coach makes them go to. They're just like, I don't really want to go to this tournament. Uh, and their result is that they don't do very well at that tournament. I always thought to myself, it's like, that's because they're not trying very hard. Uh, I can't believe that, you know, I took them to the, this tournament and they're not even trying. They're not working hard. They're just trying to go home. Okay? But, and, and it might be that. You know, you might just be like, oh, if I lose in the quarters, I can go home four hours earlier. That seems like a pretty good deal. But the other possibility um, is just that you are not marking this as something that you care intensely about. And when you don't think of it as something you care intensely about, you are unlikely to get fired up before your debates and thus do worse than uh, expected. Number 10, number 10, you must play to win. Who's ever heard of playing to win versus playing not to lose? Anyone ever heard of that? What's the difference between playing to win and playing not to lose? You can help us out here or just sort of like give it a guess. Yeah. When you play to win, you go in and you're like, okay, what am I going to do so I can go out and beat my opponents? Whereas when you're playing not to lose, you're like, okay, they've made their arguments. How do I not drop this? How do I make sure I respond to everything? And you don't have the same aggressive mindset. Like, how can I improve this? Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah, it almost sounds like offense versus defense in a debate. Like playing to be aggressive and to make sure that you win, rather than just like giving people reasons not to like not to dislike you. Yeah, that's for sure true. I was just about the worst about this of all time. Uh, I I was terrible at playing to win versus playing not to lose. I the most salient moment I think is that I have this memory. Uh, so my junior year of college, we were doing pretty well. We went into the NDT, I think we were like the, we, we got a first round, I don't remember what number we were, we were somewhere around our 10, I think, 12 maybe. Um, but we were, you know, going into the NDT and we had done pretty well all year. And there was a pretty good shot that like, I mean, we weren't expected to win the NDT, but we could have done pretty well. We were expected to do relatively well. And I remember laying in bed the night before the NDT, when I should have been just super fired up and been like, bring it on, I'm so excited, I love debate, this is wonderful. And I was laying there and I was like, please just don't let us lose in the doubles. I just don't want to lose in the doubles. If we make it to the octaves, I don't care anything that happens after that, just don't let us lose in the doubles, okay? Um, and that is a terrible attitude to have, right? Because it's like, we could have, you know, done pretty well. We might have gotten to the quarters or the semis, but because I was only worried about just like, I didn't want to be embarrassed, then I wasn't playing offensively. I wasn't playing to win. I wasn't playing aggressively. So there's a difference between playing to win and playing not to lose. Playing to win involves expending effort and taking risks. Taking risks is the important part there. Playing not to lose means you reduce your risk taking in order to avoid looking foolish. Unfortunately, the more you try to avoid making mistakes, doing exactly what he just said, where it's like you just, you just don't want to mess up, you don't want to drop something, the more mistakes you make. This is as true in debate as it is in tennis. Um, and science seems to support the distinction between playing to win and playing not to lose. Bronson and Merriman say that there's a difference between a threat condition, where you're playing not to lose, right? Everything is threatening you. And a challenge state. A playing to win is like, there is a challenge in front of me, and I am going to try and fight that challenge. And those are really different, right? One is like being scared, and the other one is getting ready to compete. 
Uh, they say in a threat condition, the heart rate increases while your heart rate variability decreases. So your heart is pounding so hard you can hear it even when you're standing still. And your blood vessels constrict. All that blood basically has nowhere to go. Your blood pressure shoots up. Your lungs also constrict. There's less oxygen going through them. And you tire out more easily. You get a short burst of energy because you uh, burn glucose during your cells. But it runs out very quickly. And then you just like feel totally defeated. In a challenge state, however, when you see an opportunity, when you're striving for something, you're still stressed. Okay, The stress is still there. But it has a different reason. Your heart rate goes up, but your veins dilate. And your blood flow improves. Your body like starts pumping blood really efficiently. And you get this invigorating rush of oxygen. Who's ever felt like before a debate that like feeling of just like, I am on top of the world, like bring it on. I, I don't care what they have to say, I am ready to go. That feeling is like the ultimate challenge state. Okay, you're fired up, you're ready to go. This is exactly what um, all those like pre-game speeches that uh, sometimes debate coaches do, but you all also see in sports coaches and in sports movies, because I didn't have any sports coaches, so I know that in movies coaches do this before the game. Uh, they try and get the people all fired up. And the reason they try and get you fired up is to make you put you in a challenge state as opposed to a threat state. They don't want you to be scared that you're gonna like lose the Super Bowl and look foolish on national television. They want you excited to win the Super Bowl. Okay? When you're playing to win, you see the debate as a challenge. You see it as an opportunity to, to try something out and take risks and be better. You're free to take risks. You get into the zone. When you're playing not to lose, you feel less energetic and you start to avoid risks. You're like, please just don't let me mess up. So how do you apply this in debate? First thing, you've got to treat each debate as a challenge. Each debate is an opportunity to practice and it's an opportunity to get better. Consistently tell yourself that, well, it's OK if you lose. This is the opportunity to take a chance to win. Who's ever heard the phrase, like, the person who wants it more often wins? Yeah, so like, people often say that about seniors debating at their last tournament. It's like they really, really, really don't want it to be their last debate, and so they overperform because they're just so fired up about you know, doing things right. Um, and, and the reason that that happens for some people is because they get into a, an extreme challenge state. Um, this is where you also should be applying those anxiety principles. So reminding yourself that being scared is good, that the you know, fact that your heart is beating really quickly is your body preparing for you to do something that is difficult. Okay, It's getting ready for you to give that YC. It's getting ready for you to extend that politics right? Just telling yourself helps you get out of the threat response and into the challenge response. Number 11, people are different. People are different. Principle here uh, is that genetic differences, gender differences, and family differences can all lead to differences in how you handle competition. The first one we're going to talk about is called warriors versus warriors. Who's ever heard about this? This was like a thing in the news a while ago. Yeah, warriors versus warriors. Um, I'm going to simplify the science a lot here, but basically there are two types of people based on how your body clears dopamine using an enzyme called COMT. I was going to write down and like say the thing that it actually stands for, but I could not do so. So COMT is what everyone calls it. Science is interesting, but it's very complicated. So here's the simplification. There are two ways that your body can use an enzyme called COMT to clear dopamine. There's a fast way and there's a slow way. And people whose body clears dopamine very quickly are called warriors. They're better at handling stress, and they're always ready for a tough fight. But these are the people who need stress and competition to get going. People whose body clears dopamine slowly are known as warriors. They're not as good in stressful situations because they get overwhelmed, but they're much better in normal situations because they don't need stress in order to get their brain going. So obviously, you're not going to like go take a genetic test in order to figure out what kind of person you are. So I have a like, if you are a debater who section here to try and figure out which one you like later. So if you're a debater who tends to think that a lot of school is really boring, and you aren't very good at routine work, and you often write your essay the day it's due, you're probably a warrior. Or sorry, a warrior, excuse me, warrior. You need something like the pressure of that deadline or the pressure of the upcoming debate tournament in order to get going. You can do work, and in fact, you will often do 
substantial stretches of work. You will, you know, these are the debaters who, like, the night or a couple days before the tournament, will cut an entire new affirmative. They'll spend, you know, ten hours. They'll pull an all nighter to cut that new app. But it's only the pressure of the tournament that led them to do that. And these people almost always do things at the last minute. They also tend to perform better than expected on standardized tests because those tests are very stressful and they're very time-limited events. You don't have to do it every day. However, if you're the kind of debater who does a little work every day, you like practicing, you like routine, you're probably a worrier. You are much better at complex thinking and just sort of getting things done. Because you can just sort of, you, you make plans, you tend to stick to those plans, because you don't need the deadline in order to make things happen, and you're good at thinking about outcomes and consequences. You are very able to be like, well, if I stay up all night, I will be tired during the debate tournament, and thus I will not perform at my best. Sadly, you can also crumble under, under pressure, and you underperform your preparation on high stakes tests like the SAT and in competition. Don't worry though, warriors can learn to perform as well or even better than warriors under pressure that they've experienced many times. This is good, because I'm definitely a warrior. So this type of debater tends to get better at handling stress over time, because although your body is not as good under pressure, you're very good at acclimating to specific types of pressure. But it has to be pretty specific. So you're the kind of person who would really benefit from going in and sitting in the Barclay Forum Auditorium and giving your practice speech there. You're also the kind of person who probably, if you get used to being nervous in debate and then you go play soccer, it's like you have to start all over. You're like, it's a whole new pressure situation and that's going to be very difficult for you again. So those of you who, in the very beginning of this lecture, when I said there's like 20 to 25 percent of people who do much worse under competitive situations, you are almost certainly warriors. Competition doesn't lead to you turning up the fire, it leads to you freaking out. For you, high stakes practice sessions are even more important. And although you probably don't want to get picked to do that practice debate in front of the lab, or to do those, you know, to be in that competition in class. Doing that over and over and over is exactly how you will become better. So you need to get out there and do that practice debate in front of the lab because then it will make doing the actual debate in front of the real people um, a little scared. The next difference uh, is about only children. Who's an only child in here? I am. Okay, who uh, among the other people? Wow, not very many. Uh, who among the other people who have ever heard that only children are selfish? They can't share. They never had to learn how to share. They're terrible at it. It turns out that this is actually mostly the opposite, which I found totally awesome and made me feel much better about myself. Uh, that only children are actually often too cooperative. Because they have never experienced scarce resources, they don't know how to be fierce. Only children in studies actually give away their toys too easily. Whereas siblings know from experience that that other kid might break that toy, or they might not give it back. They don't, they're not going to give you their toy. The takeaway seems to be that when siblings have to compete for everything, when they have to compete for, you know, playing with mom or dad's attention or even the last fruit roll up in the box, they learn when, how, and why to compete. Whereas only children don't learn how to compete from the very beginning, um, and so tend to, to be relatively not as good competitors they don't view life as a competition. Next one is gender. This one could be a whole elective. Uh, and, and you know, maybe should. It, 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 I find this very interesting and so it would be maybe another time we'll do an elective or an after or something. But um, the short version is that it seems that women, uh, while they are as likely and able to compete as men, they are only as willing to compete when the odds of winning are reasonable. So boys, you all are willing to compete even when it is overwhelmingly likely that you will lose. Okay, you're like, sure, I'll play basketball a lot. You know, I'm five foot one, but yeah, let's basketball. Let's do it. Okay, girls are like, whoa, 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 that doesn't seem like a very good deal to me. So girls tend to be a little bit better at actually assessing the odds that they will win. Uh, boys tend to be a little more overconfident about the likelihood that they will do really well. But problematically for girls, especially girls in competition and competitive environments, they're less likely to jump in as a result, and so their perform their like numbers tend to be relatively lower. There's this really interesting study of women running for Congress. 
Um, and obviously, there are a million things that play into the fact that we have a lot of dudes in Congress and not a lot of women in Congress. But, uh, and competition is obviously not the only one. But there's, there's an interesting study of competition and how it works, and it, plays, it seems to play at least a decent role. Which is that when women have at least a 20% chance of winning an election, this appears to be the tipping point, 20%, they actually are more likely to enter the race than a similarly placed man. So when they, you know, if you have a 20% chance of getting to be in Congress, girls are like, yeah, sign me up. But when they assess themselves as having less than a 20% chance, either there's an incumbent who's really good, or it's a difficult district, or there's just like a million people running for Congress in that field, they won't run. Can't really persuade them to do it. However, on average, men are like more likely to run even if they only have like a two or a three or a five percent chance of winning, and thus far more candidates are men. Obviously, substantial overgeneralizations involved here. If you're like, but I want to run for Congress even if I only have a one percent chance, please do. Um, but um, you know, the this this appears to be on average a sort of set of generalizations that apply. But girls tend to also play it a little bit too safe. Even when they have a pretty good shot, they sometimes prematurely withdraw from the activity. So that, that's a problem. And finally, girls tend to do better in what researchers call infinite contests. Infinite contests are things like school or the workplace, where you're compared over semesters or years or high school careers and a whole variety of classes. Boys tend to do a little bit better in shorter and more discrete competitions like games and sports seasons. Perhaps because they're a little bit more willing to be competitive, they're more, they, they're more interested in being competitive, having to compete all the time. It's like, where's your out? That, that seems reasonable to me. Whereas the girls, because they're a little bit less interested in the every single comparison competition, they tend to do better in the, the longer term competition. Again, on average. All right, last category of difference, introverts versus extroverts. Introverts versus extroverts. Introverts tend to do best when they are working alone. And thus, they often tend to improve significantly in a competition, like head to head. Extroverts tend to like working on a team better, but do worse in a competitive situation. They like working with people. They don't want to work against people. They, you know, let's, let's make friends here. So there are lots of extrovert debaters that I can think of who are, are very, are, are relatively talented. But they sort of like the social parts of debate, like debate camp or the going to the tournament part, better than the round itself. And there are also many debaters who are very, very, very talented but have trouble relating to other people and making friends. I'm not going to give any examples of either of those things because I will just get myself in trouble, but I'm sure you can think of yourself of someone who you know who's awesome at debate but like really awkward, okay? Or someone who is, you know, one of the friendliest people in debate, they have the most friends, but they don't do as well as anyone thinks they should. And both of those groups can take important lessons from each other. So how to apply all of these things in debate? There's a lot here, but here's a few takeaways. Warriors. Warriors. You need to focus on not getting burned out. And you need to focus on being willing to prep for debate even when it's the summer and your first tournament seems really far away. You need to try setting interim work deadlines and rewarding yourself for meeting them because then that will apply pressure even if it's sort of fake pressure. The prize has to be good enough that you actually want it. And don't cheat. So for, for some warriors, uh, have any of you ever heard of the thing, I forget, uh, it's like stick with two K's, I think, stick.com, uh, where you you can like make a bet with yourself and then you have to pay this website who will donate money to something that you don't like if you don't win the bet with yourself. Does anyone know what I'm talking about at all? Okay, well, there's this website. Wait, that exists? Because I had an idea to do that. Yeah, that I know there's exists. an alarm clock that for every time you snooze, it donates money to a charity. Yeah, yeah. So this is exactly like that. This, this, that I find that totally genius. Right, because imagine for yourself, I'm going I'm to let you picture, uh, a political group or a social group or just like a political party or a candidate that you just hate. Okay, you don't have to say it out loud, because it might probably be different for everybody. Imagine that person that you hate. And then imagine for yourself uh, that you set up a bet where if you didn't do the thing that you were supposed to do, you had to give some of your money to that cause or that candidate. Okay, there are very few things that I would hate more than having to give, uh, you know, my hard-earned, I'm a teacher money 
to political causes that I don't believe in. And so they, you are giving yourself an additional incentive. You are putting pressure on yourself in a way that doesn't exist otherwise um, to make you do something. I, that snooze alarm clock is genius. Warriors, you need to practice managing your stress. We talked about this a little bit, but you need to take risks in practice because it acclimates you for your tournaments. You should also try to attend many tournaments early in your debate career because it will reduce your anxiety about this specific issue, or your, or, well, I guess it keeps your anxiety the same, but it increases your ability to respond to that anxiety for debate, even if not in general. Girls, don't give up on debate too early. You will not know how good you are for a very long time, and also there are tons of benefits along the way. Again, could be its own lecture. Boys, try not to get too discouraged by like long-term competitions like your GPA. Many of these things require you to sort of just keep swimming, just keep swimming, just keep swimming. Uh, even when you don't already realize you're not going to be the valedictorian. And there's value in your grades whether you know you end up 10th in your class or 100th in your class. All of those things are, are useful. That's not a debate tip. That was just a bonus life tip. Extroverts. You need to recognize that you're uh, less willing to turn away from your friends in order to mercilessly beat them. Uh, and you don't need to be a meanie in order to be a good competitor. Okay? That should not be the takeaway. But you do need to remember that if your friends are really your friends, they're still going to be your friends if you beat them in the court. Okay? They're just going to be your friends who you know, are watching you debate in the semis, and that's okay. Introverts, you need to remember that you're still going to like debate if you try and make some friends. Uh, and the process will really help you in future endeavors like having a job. So try and socialize a little bit between debates, even if it's really awkward and really hard. Only children, stop sharing your toys. Stop sharing. Seriously though, um, you need to practice competing as much as possible because you don't get all of those opportunities in competing for mom and dad's affection and love and attention. Um, and so for you, it's like it's going to take you longer to get there in terms of what competition feels like and that this is an acceptable thing to do. Um, and so practicing really uh, is very useful. Number 12. We've made it all the way to 12. Teams make a big difference. Teams make a big difference. The principle, the size and type and culture of your team makes a huge difference in how successful the debaters on that team are over time. The first element of this is team culture. Team culture. It matters. And so do things like moods and energy levels. You will notice that some teams like fire each other up and are always moving in the right direction, and some teams just really struggle. Uh, it's like one person complains, and then they're all complaining, and all of a sudden, the whole mood is brought down. And this is an automatic process. It's not something that you actually try and do. So you can catch a vibe from the team. It's like you know, the same way you can catch the flu from your debate team, you can catch a Debbie Downer vibe from your debate team. We're going to talk about how to combat that in just a second. There are a bunch of problems with teams. Uh, unfortunately, teams are not always better than the sum of their parts. Okay, you think it's like if I combine debater A and debater B and debater C and debater D, and I put them all together on a team, they're going to be like A plus B plus C plus D equals awesome. That's not true. Debater, teams are often much, much worse than the sum of their parts. And this is a process called collaborative inhibition. Collaborative inhibition where the process of trying to collaborate with other people reduces the effectiveness of the people who are doing the collaborative. How many of you have ever been in a group, like a project for school, or just any type, maybe even your debate team, where you spend about as much time figuring out when and where to meet and who's going to like bring what, than you do actually doing the work? All of that is really lost time, right? Like if you're doing a politics file, and you spend 20 minutes talking to your debate partner about where you're going to meet. And she's like, I want to meet you know, at Taco Bell. And you're like, Taco Bell's terrible. Mm -hmm. I want to meet somewhere else. Taco Bell isn't terrible, by the way. It's wonderful. Don't say that about Taco Bell. Uh, but uh, if you spend all of that time, it's time that you could have just been sitting there researching the dissent, right? All of the time that you spend talking to the other person being like, well, I'll do this. And if you can research the uniqueness, I can find a new scenario. All of that is time you could have just been researching. Superstars tend to hate teams. So uh, this, this is true in sports, and I think it's true in debates, too. Uh, the, 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 the really, really talented people tend to think that the team limits their ability to be awesome. 
And they don't really want to spend a ton of their time bringing along people who don't work very hard or don't work very well. How many of you hate group projects in schools? Especially group projects where your teacher assigns you your group. Yeah, that's like almost everybody. Um, I, I always hated them too. Uh, a debater I used to coach named Megan Cambry, who's now uh, a senior at Emory, had, was complaining about a group project once in high school, and she was like, I feel like in every group, one or two people do really good creative work, and all of the other ones bring glue sticks. And I just thought that was just like this great image of like how terrible group work can be, which is that it's like, you know, you're out there and you're trying to work really hard. And you're like looking at the assignment and researching things. And this other kid's like, I'll get some markers on the tag board to put the poster together. And you're like, the markers on the tag board? Like, I didn't need someone to do that for me. How is that possibly contributing to this group? Uh, I, uh, so I hated groups in high school and then I went to college and there weren't very many group projects in college. Uh, and then I got to education graduate school um, where people love the group project. It's like collaboration and they use all these big words uh, that really just mean having to work on group projects all over again. Um, and I, you know, there were, there were some times where I even liked the people in my group but still hated the group project. It's just like I could have done this so much faster by myself. That is collaborative inhibition um, at its best. It's when all of the people in the group not only hate the group, but they hate the fact that they're in a group because it wastes their time. So what makes a difference uh, in trying to eliminate this problem? One of them is the size of the teams. The size of the teams. Generally, the most successful teams are teams that are small as possible to get the job done. Okay? As small as possible to get the job done. That last part's important, right? Not as small as possible. Can't be a one-person debate team if you do policy debate. That's you know not effective. But in a small team, everyone is responsible for the result. Everyone feels like they're contributing, uh, and everyone knows what everyone else is doing. The bigger the team, the harder this is. Right? Freeloaders increase when there are more people on the team, and hard workers start to get resentful. They're like, whoa, whoa, whoa! Why am I working so hard when you're not working very hard? And then there are just, you just lose track of what your teammates are even contributing. You lose track of who's doing the politics updates, and all of a sudden you have no update. Large teams also tend to have lots of meetings. And they have lots of meetings where there's a lot of talking. You spend a lot of time talking and not a lot of time doing things. You spend a lot of time talking about what you're going to do and who should be doing it and when they should be doing it and why they should be doing it and not just like doing the thing. In good teams, there is lots of conversation, but it's back and forth conversation, so people respond to each other. In failing teams, fewer and fewer people tend to make longer and longer speeches about what other people need to do better. So if any of you have ever been in a really frustrating team situation, maybe it's your project, maybe it's your debate team, uh, where it's like one person just keeps talking and talking and talking about how all of you need to be doing something different, all of that is not only wasted time, um, but it's further alienating the people who aren't doing what that person wants you to do. So, size of teams matter. Now, if you're saying to yourself, well, this is terrible because I'm on a big debate team. How many of you are on a team that has like more than 12 policy debaters on it? Okay, I'd say about half of you. Um, there are ways to combat this. Some of you had to count, that's awesome. Uh, some of, there are ways to combat this, even if you're on a big team. Uh, one of them is that everyone needs to have a specific role. Everyone needs to have a role. It's real, uh, the science, the, the studies of teams suggest uh, that it's a flawed assumption to think that everyone needs to be equal and everyone needs to be interchangeable. So it is fine for some people to do more and some people to do less. It is fine for some people to have more responsibility and some people have less responsibility as long as everyone knows and understands their role. And it's not even a problem, say these studies, to have you know, a, the star player, the star debater in this case, who gets special team privileges. As long as everyone understands why that person got there and why, you know, what they did to get there. How do you do this? Well, you need to talk about what you're good at. Share your strengths and weaknesses with your team instead of trying to hide behind the idea that you're exactly the same as everyone else. You are good at some things. Okay? You are presumably terrible at some things. Making your teammates aware of those things, even if it's scary, is the best way to make use of each teammate. Presumably there are those of you out there that like, I, are thinking to yourselves, you know, I should not be in charge of our Afro-pessimism answers. Okay? That would go poorly. There are others of you out there that are like, I should not be in charge of doing the politics of I am not going to be very good at that. Okay? Being willing to share that with your team 
So when they say, you know, uh, well, hey, Kendall, can you research the Afro-Pessism 2AC? And you're like, oh, I'm not so sure I can do that. People are like, I, you know, I can do this, but I can't do this. It's actually really effective. And the cool part about this is it tends to increase the rest of your team's respect for you massively. Okay, so uh, I always thought when I was a debater, and even to be honest, somewhat as a coach, if I would say, you know, I just, I don't really think I can do that, everyone would be like, oh, she can't do that. Must not be very good at her job. Or, oh, she can't do that. Why is she on the A team? Okay, but it turns out um, that what really happens most of the time is that people accept things that they can't do and then do a crappy job of it. Okay, and then all of a sudden it's like everyone's like, oh, Maggie did a crappy job of the politics updates. She must be not very good at this. But if instead I got out in front of that and I'm like, I probably shouldn't do the politics updates. Maybe I have a test this week. Maybe it's just I'm not very good at researching politics. I have no idea. If you get out in front of them and say that in the beginning, it tends to increase the team's respect of you because you then do a good job on the thing that you take on. Being honest and early and upfront about what you can and cannot contribute to the team allows everyone to contribute what they can. And they're you know, a nice little socialist paradise. Um, where everyone contributes what they can, and everyone gets what they need, uh, and everyone's happy. But um, if you are unwilling to share what you can and cannot do, um, it will just generally increase resentment and make people mad at you. Another theory of teams uh, is you don't need to be friends. A fallacy of teams is that in order to be successful, everyone needs to be BFFs. But it turns out that's not really true. It's actually more likely to be the other way around. It's not good friends create good teams. It's success leads to people being friendlier <coughs> to each other. And failure, having a team that consistently fails, leads to people not getting along very well. When I was in high school, uh, I debated with someone for the last two years, junior and senior year, for the all of junior and senior year. Uh, and we were not very good friends. Uh, Maybe may frenemy is closer to the right word. Um, but it's like we worked relatively well together. And I'm not saying we didn't fight, and we'll talk about that in a second. But for the most part, we were willing to just sort of go talk about debate and get things done. And in fact, there are some studies that suggest that a lower level of friendship can actually lead to a higher level of success on the teams because you're more willing to just go get the job done and then you know go off and do your work as opposed to spending a bunch of time chatting over the things that you mutually have in common. The other factor here is that you can argue with your teammates. Conflict isn't dangerous for teams and it's often good. When there's no conflict on a team, it's usually not because everyone agrees with each other in their happy little utopia. It's because no one is willing to say something controversial. And especially in something like debate, when all we're talking about is how to strategize and argue, you need to have a framework for disagreeing, deciding, and then moving on. So, those are sort of, that's sort of the framework for how to be a good teammate and how to make the most of your team. So I'm going to conclude with a quotation. Uh, it's from the very end of this book. And it says, to compete requires that we embrace uncertainty, that we instinctively recognize that the suspense of an unscripted outcome, even if we lose, is more rewarding than a life pre-planned. Basically, if you are willing to compete, you are saying, I would rather lose than not have the chance to win. Um, and that is, you know, a, Obviously, competition is scary, it is intense, it is anxiety-inducing, especially for certain types of people, and I'm definitely one of those people. But there's also nothing that fires up most of us like getting to actually debate. Getting to debate is a privilege, uh, and being the best competitor you can possibly be is one way to take advantage of that privilege. Thank you.